religion about magic. And we used to have a section about um, topics that the committee wanted to raise up in future meetings. Can we add that back? Because right now there's no real place for the committee to talk about things that they heard from their um, constituents or things that we want to bring up. Can we add that into the, every agenda moving forward? Just say matters from the committee that aren't necessarily on the agenda, but for future agendas. Is that okay? Well, yeah, um, I think you got that, Ryan. Just like as a like the final ten minutes of every meeting, just sort of have like matters from the committee. Sure. Yeah. And, and maybe that there's nothing, but at least some opportunity to say, hey, I've heard this, can we talk about this next week? I agree. You just be on the yeah. meters and all that Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, I can go ahead and share my screen. So I think the biggest thing that we're going to be talking about is um, we do want to spend some time uh, talking about the uh, the website. We did make some updates to the website and I am going to. Sorry, that's not, I realize, sorry guys. Um, dim the light so you guys can see a little bit. But the biggest thing that um, we wanted to do was just share some of the stakeholder discussion group feedback and I realized that you all got the document um, with very short notice. So um, we're not really asking for any final feedback, but mostly just to report back what we heard and give um, Lee and Patrick a chance to also share um, some of their takeaways from that discussion. But as you all know, we uh, conducted some stakeholder discussion groups to get an initial uh, round of feedback about the draft goals and objectives that we had developed for the long range transportation plan. So we held three different discussion group meetings. We held one with the business community. We held one with uh, public safety personnel, and then we held one with what we um, considered community partners. So these were kind of the um, both community activist groups and also some of the uh, uh, what we had um, kind of been calling uh, equity priority groups, just because each of those lists were kind of short on the, in and on this in and on their own. So we combined those into one group. Um, we started off the meetings, we provided a little bit of background about the uh, purpose of the Moving Toward 2050 Long Range Transportation Plan, described the planning process, and reviewed how their feedback would be used. So what we told them is that we would get some feedback from them with their initial responses to the draft goals and objectives, and we would use that to inform how we would be presenting information to the larger public when we got to those stages of the public engagement. We would use that to make changes and adjustments to the goals and objective language, um, add or remove goals or objectives, or recategorize the goals and objectives. And so when we got to the point where we started going through the, uh, the, the goals and objectives themselves, um, I really turned it over to the consultants to let them facilitate that discussion in order to uh, provide an opportunity for more, um, I guess, just a, a comfortable opportunities for feedback. I didn't want to kind of influence the discussion to the extent possible so that the um, consultants facilitated that discussion. So these were the original draft goals um, that we developed, safety, environment, equity and accessibility, land use and economic development, and efficiency. So one of the things that we talked about as we were going through some of the public feedback that we received, and I apologize, Marty, I don't think that this, I added this one later. <laughs> yeah, um, but we, uh, we, um, wanted to kind of better capture how these really important concepts of climate action and equity were being considered throughout the throughout the evaluation of the different goals and objectives. And so we had started by integrating some language around trying to reduce vehicle emissions and trying to um, fit these uh, equity considerations into some of those goals and objectives. But really, what happened with the climate action and the equity um, objectives specifically is that they really were kind of integrated within these other goals and objectives. So the recommendation that we're making um, is to sort of take this climate action and equity lens approach where we're saying that we are going to use this as a lens to evaluate the other goals and objectives. And we, we are going to say, is there a climate action or equity component to this that we need to capture and factor into the, um, to the analysis? And so those were going to be kind of like all encompassing. We're not going to call those out specifically within the goals and objectives necessarily, but we're going to say that, that, that 
we want to filter the other goals and objectives language through these um, lenses first. We're kind of discussing metaphors. You can think of it as like a pair of glasses. Both microscopes and telescopes both have two sets of languages. If any of these metaphors resonate well with you, we can we can talk about updating this very basic image into something else. But but the idea was that like like that's going to help how we focus the conversations. So I want to emphasize that because otherwise it gets a little bit uncomfortable that you're going to see that the word equity is crossed out in a couple of places. Um, so based on the feedback that we had, um, we did make some recommendations. Those were included in the memo. Um, so, so I can go through those recommend cha recommended changes, but I want you all to know that we'll come back and talk about these in more detail, knowing that you haven't had a lot of time to review those. So one of the things we talked about related to safety is um, the goal of reducing the frequency and, and severity of crashes and really focusing on the fact that maybe it's not necessarily a bad thing if we don't reduce the frequency, because what's really most important to us related to safety is that we're reducing the harm that is caused to people in, the, in these accidents. So it's not necessarily about reducing the number of crashes related to safety. It's about reducing the impact of the harm to people through these crashes. So we're talking about reducing the frequency of serious injury and fatal crashes, um, and th which is a little bit more consistent with the federal uh, performance targets and the goals that are evaluated there. And then um, there was a lot of discussion about the use of the term alternative modes of transportation. So um, we made some adjustments throughout to um, not use alternative modes of transportation. The concern is that that made um, active transportation or transit or other multimodal transportation feel inferior to vehicles. Um, so we, we changed the language where it seemed appropriate to, to um, improve the comfort and safety for users of the multimodal transportation system, which still has a little bit more emphasis on the uh, non-single uh, occupancy vehicle users, um, but does include all types of transportation modes as well. Um, for the environment, this is where we um, kind of started deleting uh, some of these uh, objectives that were redundant because they were covered in other um, under other goals and objectives categories. So increase the use of alternative modes of transportation. We're already talking about doing that through our emphasis on the multimodal network throughout the goals and objectives. So it felt a little bit redundant to also include it here. And then when we're talking about reducing vehicle emissions. We're really not um, evaluating that explicitly as part of our process. We are trying to do things like um, like improving uh, opportunities for uh, active transportation or uh, or better transit operations and things like that. So we we are we do want to reduce vehicle emissions, but we're not doing that in and of itself through um, through any of our uh, specific. Um, objectives, and so that's where that like climate action lens comes into play. So, I have a yeah. comment in that. So, the so reducing the average emissions on a vehicular basis is actually not an explicit goal of the long range transportation plan, like such as encouraging the adoption of low emissions vehicles or zero emissions vehicles. Yeah, that is not explicitly something that we're measuring. Yeah, yeah. What's an example of reducing the negative environmental impacts of the transportation system that does not involve reduced vehicle emissions? It could be about like actually where you're building the infrastructure. So, for example, if you're going to put something in an area that has, um, you know, uh, some sort of environmental, um, you know, species or some sort of like sensitive wetland area or something like that, it's also about really uh, making sure that we're protecting those environmental features as well. The, it seems like you know, talking, if that's the example. What about communities that live next to a highway? You know, those are species that are affected by the transportation system. Yeah, and that actually is integrated into this environmental category. So that that's also where that equity lens comes into play. Because what what we're doing is we're giving an additional priority for any of those communities that um, that would be more significantly impacted because there's some indication of you know, an equity consideration. Um, yeah. Yeah, the, the, I mean, it strikes me a little strange that we would not talk about encouraging um, modes of transportation that have um, fewer emissions. We, we are, though. We're just doing that throughout. Okay. 
So, so like, for example, in the safety, we're improving the comfort and safety for users of the multimodal system. We want to make it more comfortable for people to use a range of options. When we get to the accessibility, for example, we want to increase mode choice for all, for all users. So, so that's where it started feeling redundant. So it's the lens? It's, it, yeah. Looked at or through which yeah, yeah, exactly. Does that, any other questions? Yeah, just real quick, like, so I appreciate that explanation. I certainly didn't pick that up reading the document. Before. Sure. And, I mean, that's kind of didn't it wasn't put in the document. I suggest that you probably do do that because I saw equity struck and didn't realize the context with which people were striking it. So yeah, it, it, it is. That in it, it is mentioned in the document. It is not necessarily emphasized in the document because it, it, it's like within the paragraph. It wasn't like necessarily we, we don't have a good graphic we don't have good language around that yet so we'll be working on developing that I, I i think if we don't have the word equity throughout here though i agree that we need to like really make sure it's very clear that that's what we're doing <laughs> I, I appreciate what you're, what you're emphasizing i think it was being restored like yeah like, yeah yeah i mean just that's a pretty big change yes maybe putting that up from the top of the documents so somebody's going really, like as a bifocal tool, yeah, no, yeah. Uh, it, would it be helpful to mention like the lens in some sort of way in, as a bullet point here? Like, consider goals through climate lens or something, you know, something like that um, to make it more apparent and not, you know, but like my beautiful event. <laughs> Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll figure out how to like package that somehow. I mean, we, we do recognize that this is not necessarily um, ready to go for the public at large to sort of digest and understand that. So we probably need to develop some sort of graphic or chart or something that makes this very, very clear. Yeah. Um, and it will probably be better than that Venn diagram, but <laughs> that, that's what you got today. <laughs> You could change the colors of the different, uh, the equity and uh, environment, and, and then have a third color in the middle that blends the two. Oh, uh, yeah. In a way of, 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 that's, and, a, yeah, that's some advanced PowerPoint graphic mm -hmm. skills right there. We'll, 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 we'll see, what, it, we'll, we'll see what, what, what I can figure out with the help tool. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, so again, the equity and accessibility, that was another place where we felt like we could kind of remove that um, emphasis on the equity because we want to emphasize it throughout. So improve access. And then there was a lot of feedback about this. Um, people really didn't like the focus on jobs and opportunities. And I think you all had uh, provided that as well. So we had these conversations about, do we like this as like two, two important community destinations? And really, it's just that we want people to be able to access whatever it is that they need or want to access throughout the region. So we just kind of took off. It doesn't matter what your access. We just want your access to be better um, by having more mode choice. Um, and again, we took out that measure that was specifically related to, um, to improving that specifically for the underserved populations because we wanted to make sure that Again, that, that same very similar language was popping up in multiple places. Um, the land use and economic development. Um, there was also some feedback in the discussion group about not really liking the emphasis on economic development. But I think um, I think it's important to include because it is also one of the uh, one of the goals of the federal performance um, system considerations, and it's also considered in smart scale. So I don't think we want to delete economic development completely. But in Charlottesville, economic, the considerations around economic development seems to be more focused around um, sort of uh, to a similar extent as the land use coordination. Um, it's not so much when we talk about the economic development, it feels like it's the focus seems to be a little bit more on getting people to their work and jobs and not necessarily on things like managing freight and getting uh, freight uh, access to important destinations. So I think it makes sense to leave these groups together, at least from my perspective. 
We did want to uh, better clarify, there was a lot of confusion around um, this, the land use and economic development and what this was really trying to communicate. So I think um, we we're able to better capture that we want to align transportation system improvements with the local land use goals. So to make sure that where the localities have identified that they want their growth areas to be, that we are considering transportation solutions that will support um, the, those development decisions. Any questions on this one? Yeah, I'm not unclear what that really means in terms of land use goals. But you know, land use has a very specific meaning around here. It has to do with zoning. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't know, I wouldn't know how to translate that into anything. I think this I, is I, I see I see the objective goal there, but yeah. I don't know if it relates at all to land use. Really what we're trying to measure here is how to um yeah, th this is just a tricky one to communicate all around. So if you all have thoughts or ideas, that's certainly helpful. What we're really trying to communicate here is that the localities have identified where they want to have these high density mixed use areas, where they want there to be growth and where they want people to be able to travel efficiently within those areas. They want to concentrate development in certain areas. So this is really about how do we prioritize or how do we evaluate transportation solutions that will help make those dense areas better connected so that those things that are all within the growth area can be accessed easily um, from other places within those growth areas. We're trying to connect the stuff in the growth areas effectively and efficiently. When you say growth, I'm, I'm on the AC44. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm more sensitive to this than any other. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, we already have identified where our density areas in the county is. I, mm -hmm. I don't know what the city is doing. Somebody else has to explain that. But uh, so, are you saying that you want to have connection between the various high, already identified density areas, or are you suggesting the town that we should, in land use, have new density areas? That's really unclear. Land use is a local decision. So, we are not suggesting where the, the growth areas should be. We just want to make sure that we are considering transportation solutions that support the identified land use um, growth decisions that the localities make. That's really what that's trying to communicate. Isn't that, well, that's really done in the sense, there is actually done in the sense of maybe equity and through the lens of equity, because when you're doing land use, you want to make sure people have access to transportation. Mm -hmm. Also, in terms of environmental impact, mm -hmm. I, I wonder if you really need this. You know, transportation because it overlaps a little bit transportation decisions. You wonder if we. I, I, I think. This, this land use and economic I, I, I think we need to include it because. because it is also part of the evaluation of projects through smart scale and because it also speaks to the climate action um, objectives. Okay. And, you know, it's really I agree. I think it's totally important to keep because there is a connection between transportation supporting land use and land use mm -hmm. transportation needs. But I do think it's interesting. Um, that's a pretty broad statement there. And it is kind of somewhat. When you started explaining about these activity centers, the density centers that you're talking about, the light bulb clicked for me. Mm -hmm. like, oh, that's what you're saying. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's some way that you can be, I mean, little ladies' rules that come with real parties, you know, that's broad. Like, yeah. To connect it with those areas where transportation demands are going high, that you do more dense areas. That makes a lot of sense. I don't think, I think we can wordsmith a couple. Terms in there. Yeah, I think th th this was. Well, yeah, that's helpful. This, this has been a, this has been like one that's been hard to communicate succinctly. So <laughs> sounds like we're not quite there yet. <laughs> it feels like the access is present, and this is this future outlook for where you'll need access. Not based on land use decisions to build density in place, then you'll need access. There could be a component to that. There, there, there could be a component. There's also components where there's like, you know, maybe a school next to, you know, there, there's a school that maybe there's a gap between a neighborhood and a school that isn't there. So it could be that there are already these existing opportunities to have connections that aren't um, already there. And we might want to prioritize those more. And that gets captured in the access. 
Yeah, so so the difference between the accessibility and the land use is probably the accessibility is trying to help people get to like help people improve how many places they can get within a certain period of time. So it's focused on how people are traveling versus the land use, which is really talking about how are the destination points connected. So they are very similar. I agree. This is this has been very confusing to try to explain. Does that help or confuse things more? Um, Sandy and yeah. also Michael, um, it is uh, uh, multimodal um, uh, infrastructure. Is, is that part of VDOT's language now in, in terms of yes. And And so in land use, for instance, now uh, VDOT has a substantial um, say in what happens with development at an intersection or even along the stretch of the road with deceleration lanes, sight lines, and so on. Does that also apply to multimodal? That's my question. In terms of, um, you've got this nice development to put in some linear and here, but there's nothing in between. Um, and so that, um, that perhaps what what would uh, what this could lead to would be language uh, where if if the city or the county had a grant, they would go to the developer and say, you will not get your permit unless we see this type of infrastructure, just as you would with the highway. You would have it with the multimodal. And as an example, uh, in the city, the city's gone through a, uh, a kind of a radical upsetting, which um, uh, people, uh, uh, affordable housing advocates, uh, I, I think, can count as a victory because part of that is developers are given incentives mm -hmm. to, to do uh, under market uh, units. And, and so in this way, um, land use, again, a local matter, you're not telling people what to do with their land, mm -hmm. but if they're going to do what they're allowed to do, part of the package is to uh, connect it to the multimodal to the extent that they can. Yeah, that's probably... Is, is that already there? That's my question. I don't know. <laughs> Um, to, to a certain extent, Michael, I don't know, or, or, or Chuck, I don't know if you heard the question, and feel free to jump in if you have better things to say about this than what I'm about to say, but but I would say the, the, the opportunity for VDOT to require transportation improvements as part of a development is pretty limited to the direct impacts of what that site is going to do. So if there's like a gap half a mile away between a new development and a grocery store or shopping center or something like that, that's not necessarily within VDOT's purview or the locality's purview necessarily to be able to require that. Is that accurate? Yeah, but maybe that's an example of how transportation planning can affect land use because, say, take an example of US 250 East of Charlottesville. If that road were improved, much more development could go there. That's that road is what, in its present condition, is what's limiting development. So if you want a development there, then you know it's a cart before the horse kind of thing. If you if you first improve the road, which is what the neighborhood associations are insisting on, then it'll support more development. Likewise, density in, in the city. If, if people are concerned about traffic impacts. If you first improve the, the traffic flow through intersection improvements or mm -hmm. whatever, widening roads or, or providing more bike lanes or whatever it is, then that supports the development. So the so the development. So so the two are kind of interconnected. And, and uh, I know that's what you're trying to say. There. It's just if, like I say, I appreciate that it's complicated. Yeah. You know, just, and, and and again, if you think of the affordable housing people. They've been hollering about this for 20 years plus, and it's just here. So mm -hmm. we're looking at 2050. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying is that, that maybe that's a place for this to go. And, 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 and again, Lee's amplification of that was, was okay, you've got this rural area, this, this rural road in a growth area. Mm -hmm. um, here's how you're going to fix it if you want to fix it. 
whether the developer does it or or the jurisdiction does it through smart scale or whatever. Yeah, I think. I I, I think some of that is captured through through other areas as well. So this isn't the only place, but but yeah, I think really what we're trying to do is we're trying to yeah make transportation efficient, safe, and effective in the designated area so that people are able to. So those are desirable places for people to work and live and stay and you know travel travel efficiently within those areas. So if I were to try to I would say to support land land. Use, uh, you create a significant infrastructure uh, to uh, multi-mode infrastructure, use that designation, to connect designated growth areas, mixed use areas, schools, and, uh, and, other, uh, and other community resources. It's the connect portion that you've emphasized that's not there. And I think that's okay. what I thought would be Maybe, Maybe helpful. To me, at least. I don't know how else. Do you? Uh, what was it originally? Integrate transportation system. Oh, okay, it wasn't any clear originally. <laughs> okay. So what you're doing is, is providing. Sunny, could that? Could that? Providing multi-mode infrastructure to connect us to growth areas, mixed use areas, mm -hmm. and, and new community resources, rather than what you said. Okay. Connection is what, what I thought you were emphasizing, and it's not apparent from that other than okay. what you're saying. I mean, that's no, that's helpful. That's helpful to hear. Ne what, what was it, Nicholas? Go ahead. Yeah, um, I, yeah. I just. I just want to say that um, maybe I'm, I'm moving far ahead of what you're here now, but I understand that this is a planning thing, in fact, a long range planning. But I'm just wondering, mm -hmm. that particularly in high risk. Because now we are talking of an integrated system where you are talking of mass transit and highways. I'm just wondering whether, particularly in the highway system, there will be something that will be involved in the evaluation that will take into consideration capacity, throughput, and level of service. I have not heard anything about that, about this interaction. Is, are you yeah, that, that's in the um, efficiency category, which is at the end of this. So we, we just haven't gotten there yet, but we will. Okay. Yeah. All right. So we'll, we'll, we'll take another, we'll make another attempt at this one, it sounds like. But I appreciate that, Marty. Maybe we'll focus, maybe we can work the word connectivity within the um, identified growth areas or, 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 or something along those lines might be more clear. All right. Efficiency. Yay, we made it. <laughs> Um, so this is where we're really looking at trying to look at where there are some capacity limitations and figuring out what opportunities there might be to improve the capacity. One of the things we did was we moved this uh, fill bicycle and pedestrian connectivity gaps. That was originally part of the, I believe it was, um, yeah, it was part of the land use and economic development. So we moved that to the efficiency. Um, just because that is a way for the bicycle and pedestrian networks to be efficient is to be complete and not to have network gaps. I think there's an argument for it to go in either place, but this felt like it um, more comprehensively um, indicated that we were trying to take this full system multimodal approach across the board with all of these um, different criteria. So we're looking at um, opportunities to improve the roadway system reliability through operational improvements, and then also to increase system capacity at identified bottlenecks, um, and then maintaining the existing system in a state of good repair. This is not something that we're actually gonna be measuring just because it's not actually um, something that the MPA prioritizes as prioritized at the state level, but it still felt like it was important to talk about being good stewards of our existing transportation system. So those are kind of the reasons we made some of these adjustments from what we had originally. But I'd also be interested, um, Lee and Patrick, if you all had any feedback from sitting in on the discussion groups that you all wanted to maybe share or highlight. Well, as I mentioned before, uh, mostly by your uh, understanding was that uh, uh, the Department of Transportation is responsible for the consultants taking the notes, but I mean, they, they did an excellent job of summarizing the discussion. I mean, I had exactly the, the one with the business community uh, I, I felt that they captured everything. I mean, I took my own notes and I compared it, mm -hmm. and I, I didn't see if they missed anything. So, uh, so we can rest assured that they're doing a good job of, of capturing uh, what what's said. Yeah, I, I would second that. 
Um, the meeting um, I attended was the uh, safety people, and um, they, uh, the facilitator there almost got bowled over uh, <laughs> trying to get through all five or six or seven. Uh, basically, what we talked about was um, safety, accessibility, and efficiency, mm -hmm. and, um, and uh, particularly saying these notes on those. Mm -hmm. uh, I recognized every one of them. I mean, I'm sure some of them were repeated at some of the other meetings, but uh, almost verbatim, I think, came out of uh, out of our meeting. And, um, uh, and 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 I will also say, just just impressionistically, I was I was uh, bowled over myself. Um, everybody at the safety meeting was at the operational level, and so. Um, it was um, uh, a very frank and, and nuts and bolts kind of uh, discussion in our group. And, um, and, and in retrospect, seemed to represent the, the starting point. In other words, if, if we're looking at 2050, this is clearly where we are right now, mm -hmm. what these people were talking about. And, um, and, uh, and, and they added, added the plan. From their perspective, I, I thought it was perfectly accurate. Okay. Can I ask you a question about just to yeah. clarify when you're talking about efficiency? Mm -hmm. Did you say you have not, there's no measurement for the for the state of good repair? For the what? For the state of good repair. Office of office. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I have a question. Yeah. Um, so perhaps this is covered under accessibility because increased mode choice for all its users is very broad. Mm -hmm. But it strikes me because of the land use and economic development um, uh, objective that we mentioned growth areas and mixed use areas, um, but there's no real mention of uh, all. Uh, alternatives for folks in rural areas, um, and my thought on that is like, like hopefully, like with uh, changes in um, like zoning and what have you, these high growth areas will become more affordable, so the people who have been pushed out of the city uh, can maybe come back. But say there's still going to be plenty of people living in um, rural areas, and right now, like they only have car like the only way to get around is to use cars for the most part or to get on a bike on a road with a car mm -hmm. and that presents particular uh, particular safety challenges right um so i'm just wondering if, if perhaps there should be something in there to to talk about like consideration of uh alternate alternate routes that you know uh straight from that cars used. I don't know, sorry, <laughs> yeah, so that will be covered a little bit in the accessibility, but also part of the reason that we're not focusing on the rural areas is because the MPO is defined as the urbanized area. So, so there are parts of it that are more rural than others in character in characteristics. You know, our MPO does go quite a ways outside of the outside of the urbanized areas. So that's why we're not really talking about how to get people from you know Earliesville to like Charlottesville, because that's, you know, outside of the scope of right. what we're covering. But there was a lot of discussion at the business group uh, about connectivity between, or more and more between uh, Crozet and, and Charlottesville. Because mm -hmm. those are two uh, areas that are in the MPO, and, and, and being able to bike safely from Crozet to Charlottesville definitely are, are, are goals shared by a lot of those people. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? I was yeah. going to ask about the safety, just to go back. Mm -hmm. So, so remind me, Andrew, through getting people's opinions. I get a lot of pushback <laughs> on bicycles. I felt they were uh, somewhat um, dangerous. I'm going to get killed here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, they, were, they were safety hats, and particularly because there aren't very good paths for them on the road. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of people are experiencing hikers not following traffic rules. 
And I'm wondering how that fits into what we're doing. And I was going to say, in one person brought up, I think in Denmark, the way they have it set up, they have the bike lane, car parking, and then the major transportation lanes. Mm -hmm. So but I, I wonder how is this safety and process? Yeah, okay. well, we, I, I, I don't know specifically. Marty, that we're going to get into that level of um, detail in this plan specifically, but we are also doing the Safe Streets and Roads for All plan, which is going to look at multimodal system considerations. Right. And, and I think as we, you know, what, what we're really trying to do with the Long Range Transportation Plan is take a high level look at what our priorities need to be, and then we'll start working to develop solutions. So I think it's probably going to be as we start working through how what is the right solution to some of these system deficiencies that we've identified as really high priorities is when we start having those discussions. But when you, when, as we go through this, and that's why it is not happening. But uh, as we talk about multimodal, you're talking about bikes in there. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I'm still sort of concerned how we're just going to broad brush that as it goes along, or how's that lens going to work? And, well, I think the way it works is we're going to say we need to improve that there's a multimodal system need here. We need to figure out how we can get bikes safe, safely from, you know, along this corridor between this point and this point. And then we're going to look and say, is that by creating a shared use path? Is that by creating a bike lane? We're going to start having conversations about what the potential solutions might be. And then we can talk about, you know, what what is going to be the best solution that we can implement for those. And do you want to say anything, Michael, from VDOT's perspective on on how y'all are kind of approaching this? There's a new trails program at the state, so I think they're looking beyond just, you know, roadway solutions for bike paths, but I don't know. So is that part of this working for solutions other than roadways for bikes as we talk about multimodal? I, it could be. Are you defining multimodal eventually in this document somewhere along the line? Um, we, I, I don't know that I've considered whether or not there would be a definition in here, but we can if it feels like we need to. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. <laughs> I mean, trains, Absolutely. airplanes, yes, you know, light airplanes. We're really talking about surface transportation. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Maybe there will be added somewhat someday. I don't know. Do you, do you want to add anything about the trail system or the state's approach to these non-roadway? It's, it's a mode of, it's a way to go from point A to point B. Um, we can do it either on the road network or we can do it on a trail network. Um, the trails don't necessarily have to follow the roadways. So there's a lot of flexibility when you get to some of these other modes about where they go um traditionally we run them along the roadways because that's how we've done it um but there's a lot of of trail systems out there that are off-road that may be more beneficial and provide the same use for bicyclists and pedestrians um and it would possibly be safer for them because they're not having to mix with the vehicle traffic that's traveling up and down the road so those are some of the things that we'd have to evaluate. Um, the big thing about this is um, as part of the long range plan, you need to, we're gonna note, we're gonna identify where the, where the critical needs are. And then how we solve those needs is the next step. Um, so let's, let's get through the process and identify where the, where the issues are. And then we can work on studying what the best solution is to address that need. Does that make sense? Exactly. I can see though sorry, that 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 people look at the lens of environmental impact and say we need to have bikes and and and, and push it beyond you know maybe what's reasonable in terms of safety or other issues or in terms of planning. And so it's not so clear to me that that just saying that somehow I, I don't have a good sense of the process because we're going to have advocacy groups. We probably have them here in the room. I <laughs> so I, and, I, and I just don't see it. I don't I don't see how you're going to sort through all of that in a, 
in the process? It, it's because we don't have to sort through all of it in this one process. The, this is this is one process that helps set us up for the next series of processes. Processes. Yeah, like Sandy yeah. said, this is this is identifying where the needs are, uh, and um, prioritizing those needs. Then after we've got that list of, of needs, then we would basically start working on how we're going to solve those needs or what solutions we're going to use to address those needs. And that's more getting at what you're talking about. But that's something that we would do as a next step after the long range plan is developed. Thank you, Chuck. Any other? Yeah, I, I think. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, Stuart. <laughs> two, other, two other advantages to uh, trail development. Uh, and, and I'm speaking to the city now because that's where I live. And um, uh, almost all of the trails in the city go along waterways. So, from an end user standpoint, you have the advantage of uh, a couple million years of evolution. Uh, taking care of all the hills. Mm -hmm. They're, they're, they're probably <laughs> flat. Um, and then from a cost basis, um, I, I know there is acquisition of right away issues right now, uh, both in the city and the county. But um, bike lanes in, in the traffic lane uh, have, have a need out spec to me in terms of depth of roadbed, depth of um, uh, pavement and so on, uh, you could build a very good bike lane along a creek somewhere or, or a multimodal mm -hmm. um, that um, would have culverts in all the right places and have proper grading and everything else. Maybe be a nice piece of uh, structure uh, that, that would have not much more than a suburban driveway spec. And uh, that's got to be cheaper. Um, and and, um, and 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 again, a little more user friendly. Uh, and 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 the huge advantage is that the uh, both cyclists and pedestrians don't have to interface with traffic at all. Mm -hmm. So I hear that from cyclists too. Yeah, uh, yeah. I don't put my bike lanes on the busiest roads. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honestly, yeah. yeah. There. So so yeah, that's that's worth. Um, making sure even if it's in the back of your mind and not in the text mm -hmm. uh, to bring that along as as you speak with mm -hmm. you know the jurisdictions here as well as media sure mm -hmm. yeah and the next slide i think it is keep going uh, one more efficiency one more um, <laughs> How'd y'all know? Um, improved roadway system reliability. Is it reliability or is it efficiency? Are our roads unreliable or are we just using those kind of as synonyms? Is it, did we talk about this, Curtis? Do you remember? Sandy, I remember at our meeting, <laughs> and reliability in the way you were using it or are using it is. is um, uh, that someone who goes into a roadway can rely on the results. Predictability. Predictability. That's yeah. maybe a better yeah. term. Because I'm not going to be sitting there for three and a half hours. Yeah. 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 It's, like, it's, more, it's more like if you think you need, it takes you an hour yeah. a day, even if it's congested. You know, yeah. There's a lot of people, a lot of peak hour, it could be there half an hour. But you know it's going to be an hour every day. Yeah. Yeah. Reliability means it's usually an hour. Yeah, yeah. Hour to be sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes being 30 minutes, sometimes being two hours. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the, the, this was one. I don't. I don't remember if this was one that we that we talked about specifically. If we wanted to use reliability, um, there are like technical terms for some of these, and then there are layman's terms for some of these. So, if predictability makes more sense, we could also use predictability. If I was going to say, like reliability has a statistical definition. It's basically variance. Right, whereas the efficiency yeah. is the mean, is the average. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's the federal heavy definition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, it could also be efficiency. That would probably also make sense. <laughs> um, 
I think reliability is based on system efficiency and also uh, maybe safety. Those might be the two very, yeah, okay, cool. All right, any other feedback or thoughts? High level or in the weeds either way? Okay, cool. Well, I think, um, I don't know, Ryan, I can stop sharing my screen if you want to. Do you have the website ready to pull up or do you want me to do that? Yes. We just wanted to let you know that we're still working on the uh, website. We have a couple more things to do, but we've incorporated a lot of your feedback into it. I don't know if any of you all had a chance to uh, look at it before tonight. <laughs> do you want me to pull it up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Where am I? There we go. All right, so we go down to our fancy little logo here and get a visit plan page. So we adjusted some of the language a little bit. We added some pictures. We broke up the text. Um, the content is still largely the same, but we did we did add the slide about how can we reduce the climate change impacts of the transportation system. So we made sure that we are capturing that. Um, let's see, added some little logos, broke this up a little bit, tried to like emphasize those main, um, main areas. So we'll have to obviously update this language once we finalize the goals and objectives, but we'll do that. It looks a little bit better on a not pink screen, but um, if you guys can... <laughs> no, these are not the official official colors, unfortunately. Um, so these, like, why is it important? We tried to um, like limit the text so you can hit these little buttons to expand it, and it will tell you more and link to some of the projects um, and other information. But that way, when you go to the page, you can kind of just scan through it if you don't want to engage that in that much detail. And then we added some uh, links to some other documents. We still need to work on the project timeline and we're having um, another meeting with our um, consultant to get this updated or our um, web manager to get this updated. But just wanted to let you all know that we're getting pretty close to wanting to post some of these process documents up for the public. And um, as we get ready for the, for the phase of like the broad public engagement, we'll start posting information up here. So we're pretty close to like start sending people information to direct them to this web page but any feedback or thoughts or comments nope <laughs> we're getting there okay cool do you want me to keep going lee yeah, well, <laughs> I don't remember what's next, so. <laughs> Federal grants. Federal grants, okay. Yeah, all right. So let me stop sharing because that's not the right thing. All right. So the first one I wanted to let you know about is that we, um, this is a very busy page, so I apologize for that. But, um, as you all know, we had applied for the uh, Ravana River Bicycle and Pedestrian Bridge in round five of smart scale, and it was not awarded. So for those of you that are not familiar with this project, we've been putting a lot of effort into um, um, creating a connection across the Ravana River between uh, the Woolen Mills portion, they're both actually both in Albemarle County, but the Woolen Mills area right here, and then the uh, Pantops area right here behind, uh, this is what used to be the State Farm Building, um, connecting to the lower portion of Pantops. So this has been an identified need. The MPO has um, done a lot of work to sort of identify the general idea, go through and work with the um, VDOT to do a feasibility study, identify a preferred alignment, and then submit the application. What happened when we submitted the application, as you all may recall, is that um, it's in a sensitive area, it's crossing a river, they're gonna have to do some borings into the um, into mid-river sediment island. There were a lot of unknowns about exactly what the, um, the, the, the ground was going to look like in order to determine what kind of um, engineering structures are going to have to be placed and what it was going to take to put the piers in, those kinds of things. 
So there was a really high contingency factor. And then what happened is that, that we started with a base cost of $18 million for the project. There's a 60% contingency that was added to um, the construction phase of the project. And then there's an additional inflation um, escalation that's added on top of the base cost plus the contingency. And so what happened is that this project escalated to uh, $42 million when we submitted the grant application. And so even though the um, smart scale scoring process acknowledged that there were really high benefits to this project, the cost that the final cost that was associated was 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 too high for this to be competitive. So what we did was um, the project was pretty much already scoped out. So what we did was we applied for a grant through the RAISE program, which stands for Rebuilding American Infrastructure through, with Sustainability and Equity to complete the preliminary and um, engineering phase, which would answer a lot of those unknowns and help us hopefully um, have a more <coughs> accurate estimate for what the actual construction cost of the project would be. So the RAISE um, discretionary grant program, it was formally, I don't remember what any of these acronyms stand for, but BUILD or TIGER, you might have heard, you might have heard of these grant programs, but they're large federal grant programs. They're highly competitive. They cover all modes of transportation and, um, and they include both um, funding for both uh, planning and implementation. So there was a little bit of additional funding that was added to these uh, programs through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. So in FY23, yeah, um, there was $115 million that was designated for planning grants and um, out of a total of $775 million. Um, because we are just doing the preliminary engineering, even though it's considered an engineering phase, um, According to the raise uh, um, notice of funding opportunity, anything that goes up to the right of way acquisition phase is considered planning. So we applied for a planning grant to complete the pre construction activities. Um, this is the merit criteria that the raise grant uses to evaluate projects. So um, there are eight merit criteria safety, environmental sustainability, quality of life, mobility and community connectivity economic competitiveness and opportunity, state of good repair, partnership and collaboration and innovation. And uh, basically we have to, we have to create an application and set to explain, this is why our project aligns well with these criteria. Uh, projects are scored on each of the merit criteria. They'll be given a high, medium, low or non-responsive score. And um, then based on how well they score in each of those eight categories, they'll be signed an overall rating. So the highly recommended category gives us the best chance of having our project considered for funding. We needed high scores and six criteria and no non-responsive scores. I believe that this project has the opportunity to score well in at least six of these criteria, probably just six, they're probably not more than that. But um, so, so this, this does align very well with the raise grant criteria and we're hopeful that it will be a competitive application. There's another analysis, so, so the best projects get forwarded to, um, to be considered, uh, you know, in, in additional rounds of evaluation and then, um, but, but the, the challenge is that even though um, the, the project or the application may be strong, it's a discretionary grant program and they're trying to fund a diversity of applications. So they're looking at different modes, they're looking at different states, they're looking at a good mix of urban versus rural. So even if it's a good application, we may not get funded because it's not the right type of application. Um, so what we included in the project scope was to complete the preliminary engineering. You can see a list. Those are some of the tasks that will be completed. Um, TJPDC staff will be the project sponsor and fiscal agent. And then um, it was really, we were really excited to be able to collaborate with VDOT who um, agreed to administer the technical aspects of the project. So, um, you know, Michael and I worked really hard on the application and VDOT made sure that we provided a lot of the information and, and had all of that accurate. So what ends up happening is that if we are successful, VDOT will um, take the lead on, you know, doing all the things that VDOT does in order to prepare a project that would potentially go to the right of way in construction phases. So then we know that, um, you know, if we are successful in receiving this funding, we'll get the information we need and VDOT, this will all comply with VDOT's requirements to develop the project and it will be ready to continue to move through their pipeline. The total funding that we ended up requesting is just a little over $3 million and we'll find out at the end of June. Um, 
like I said, even the program is very highly competitive. If we are not successful this round, um, you know, that, that what they told us in one of the webinars is that sometimes it takes several rounds for good applications to be funded, um, and they do offer debriefs for all applications. So we could, um, if we're not successful, we could have a debrief and determine whether or not we would like to resubmit for future rounds. Any questions on the RAISE grant? No. And I would, I would sincerely like to thank VDOT and especially for my goal for all the coordination. It was a lot to pull together in a very short time period. Uh, quick question. Yeah. Um, so, and this is all said, another three million will get us basically construction drawings to build the bridge. Well, in the it will yeah the construction drawings, but also the evaluation of like all the environmental mitigation, the geotechnical, and it will also. But it will include. Yeah. What you're ready to go. Yes. Yes. So it will get you yes. to the right of way phase. Yeah. And you have to obtain the right of way. It's usually. Some engineering that happens after the right away phase of final documentation. But it would it would be a, a generally defined what the project's going to be and its impacts and you know, to always make these calls. And then are we re going through smart scale with a better less contingency? Is that the, uh, the, the idea? Yeah, that's one potential option. It could be smart scale. It could be we go back to a, for, for a raise grant for implementation too. That 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 will really give us information we need to determine what a viable path forward might be. I, I prefer it to be a smart scale application, but we'll see. In small see. scale, sometimes <laughs> the county or the city have added some money to the application. Would it have helped if we said that we would provide some of the funding, part of it? It's only $3 million, I know. <laughs> well, well, not at that stage, because we're talking about $42 million. No, no, but for this stage, if we had we request, we're requesting $3 million for this next stage, and yeah. we said we'll contribute $500,000. Well, this is for a raise grant. So, so, so for a raise grant, that actually does not factor in. Factor. Yeah, that that That's actually. Really yeah, but when we get to smart scale, when once we I know. That yeah, that. yeah. What's the timeline of smart scale? What is the next? Like, how does this finding this out tie into all this? Um. So. So. Yeah. So. We'll see. For, first, we have to see if we get funded, and then there's going to be some lead time before the, like, the funding is made available. And I think the um, timeline we developed, Michael, was it three years for VDOT to complete the PE? Probably, you be ready for not the next round, round six, but probably round seven. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Stuart. Uh, speaking of discretionary grants, yes. uh, yesterday I think the Fed announced 2.5 billion in discretionary grants for communities for alternative fuel charging. <clears throat> so like for communities to get money to put chargers, uh, for example. Any sense if Charlottesville Alamaro is going to apply for any of those grants? I doubt that that would be the MPO because Unless, unless I am wrong, I think that that is for like actual installation of the charging infrastructure. Is that your understanding? I think that's part of it, yeah. Okay, so I, I I don't know if the city or the county, and I haven't seen anything recently. But the other grants I was looking at was more about the implementation, which wouldn't make as much sense for the MPO to to move into that space. Yeah. I don't know. But if you have that email and you want to forward it to me, I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah. Any other questions about the raise grant? Right. I think we sent out the uh, press release to you all about the Safe Streets and Roads for All Discretionary Grant Program, but this is one that you all will also be hearing a lot about because we just found out that we were awarded just <laughs> uh, $857,000, which is Includes a 20% match by the localities for just under 1.1 million to um, develop uh, multi jurisdictional comprehensive safety action plans for our region. So, this is a grant that was established by the bipartisan infrastructure law as well that, uh, that um, allocated between five and six billion dollars over the next five years, so a billion dollars per year for five years. Um, specifically focusing on um, reversing the trend that we've seen that we're seeing right now of the increase in uh, roadway dust and serious injuries. 
um, there were two uh, tracks for the for the grant programs planning and implementation. But in order to apply or be eligible for implementation grants, um, you first had to have a qualifying comprehensive safety action plan in place. None of the localities in our region had a comprehensive safety action plan, so we are um, we were able to work with all six of the jurisdictions throughout the region, and um, all of them uh, agreed to participate and provide the match. Um, the comprehensive safety action plan components um, include these eight different uh, factors that are required to be considered. So there has to be a commitment from your leadership to um, identify and set some of these uh, performance met metrics around uh, around safety. So some of these, you might hear of these zero vision plans where localities are saying basically any serious injury or roadway death rate that's above zero is, is something that is not acceptable and we want to do everything we can until we reach zero or, um, or else seriously uh, reduce what the, what the serious injury and crash rates are from what they are currently. There's going to be the development of an oversight group we're going to be working with VDOT um, and some of the funding programs that, that they have to also do a comprehensive safety data analysis that will be incorporated into the development of the safety action plan. Um, it has to include substantive stakeholder engagement, um, which also informs uh, this next requirement, which is that the process has to be inclusive and representative. Um, it will include not just looking at infrastructure, but also looking at how enforcement and uh, potentially policies and processes that are implemented impact safety outcomes, as well as looking at public education and information sharing efforts. Um, and then from this, each locality will um, identify their priorities for projects and strategies that they will um, are willing to um, support in order to reduce crash outcomes. And then we also have a requirement to conduct ongoing monitoring and reporting. Um, to uh, to reflect back on how successful um, the implementation of the safety action plan strategies are. So this is a full uh, scope. So you would say reporting successful. That means you're going to get the grants. Is that right? And some of those steps mean you have to get the grants. You can't say how successful it is. Yes. So monitoring and reporting to get the grants. Sure, sure. Some of them might be grants for infrastructure, but some of them might also be looking at, you know, what are some of the public information safety? What are some changes and how we enforce some of the safety laws? It, it's really trying to take a look at um, what are all the different ways that all of these people who are focused on the safety on roadways can come together. And what do you find as localities? I know this is still, <laughs> I mean, I, I, who do you find as localities? Well, our, our agreements are with uh, um, jurisdictions. So Charlottesville, Albemarle, Nelson, Flavana, Louisa, and Greene County. So all of those are their transportation departments are going to contribute people, or how is that going to work? Or, or representing them, or, providing them feedback, or what? We will have to develop stakeholder groups with we'll probably have a tier we'll probably have a big stakeholder group and then we'll probably have individual stakeholders that we work with at each of the localities as well when is, how is, when is that going forward just um well we're having the kickoff meetings with the usdot already so um i i think they're trying to be as expeditious and flexible at making that funding available but once and probably within the next month or two is when the funding will be available Um, so this just shows some of the benefits. It's going to give us better information about crash locations and uh, what the contributing factors are. Um, it's multimodal in nature, so we're looking at safety for all types of users. Um, it will help us do some uh, relationship building among stakeholders. In addition to the planning people that are normally involved in these discussions, we'll also be um, engaging with the health department, with um, the public safety personnel, um, maybe with some of the school systems, you know, we'll need to work with our localities to really figure out who the stakeholders are that need to be part of the discussion. But, you know, all, all of these uh, entities are working on safety from a different perspective and trying to bring all of them together, I think, is a really good opportunity for this. And then what will also um, help us create a pipeline of projects that we can um, continue to find opportunities to implement either through SmartScale or some of the other state programs or even the federal federal programs. 
um, as long as those are available. Um, it was a multi-jurisdictional application, so I think I already covered that. So one of the other benefits is that it will also support information sharing um, between the localities, not just uh, among the different stakeholders at the localities. And then the TJPDC already has these different committees that are set up through the MPO and through um, the Rural Transportation Program that can support the ongoing monitoring and reporting functions. So the total project funding was just under $1.1 million. Um, nearly half of that is scoped to go towards a stakeholder and public engagement. Um, and like I said, we're working with VDOT on uh, the data collection and the crash analysis. So any other questions on this project? Yeah, yeah, we will. <laughs> Got to come up with a with a catchy name. Additional matters from the public, which I presume is still under the public comment line. So, to Stuart's point, anyone from board here have any comments? I already raised mine about the. Discretionary grant, so I'll, I'll see what I can find if that's relevant to the Sure. Oh, we forgot to introduce you to Walter Curtis in the midst of things. Curtis is our new transportation planner that started. Oh, how, how, how long speech, ago, Curtis? Speech. About a month ago. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, we we were a little um we were a little preoccupied at the beginning with trying to get the technology going. Thanks. Welcome, cool. Curtis. Thank you. Thank you all for sitting in the dark with us tonight. <laughs> I did, I did. I thought of you as I was grabbing them.